Uh, I, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. I just want to take a second to uh, thank Pastor Tilly and Mrs. Tilly for this great, gener generous opportunity that they always give me. And uh, um, I, I just want to, it's just such a, a great opportunity to, to be here and to talk to my home church. And so I just want to get started in prayer. Excuse me, one moment. Okay, so let's just get started in prayer and let's just open up our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your great goodness for your power, for your love, for your mercy. We thank you that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, we just ask you, although we might be in our separate homes or although we might not be physically together, Lord, I ask that you still move that your power would still move, that you would move upon the hearts of your people, Lord. This day, oh God, I ask that you would shake our hearts, that you would show us what you desire to show us, that this Sunday, that this first Sunday of 2024, we would be marked by your presence, by your goodness, by your love, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So I, I want to start with a verse. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you all are doing well. You know, I, I hope you're all staying warm in your homes while it snows outside but let's um let's start let's let's open up our bibles to the book of joshua i want to bring you to joshua 23 verse 11 joshua 23, verse 11. And I, I'll be reading from the, the New King James Version. <clears throat> so, the word says in Joshua 23, verse 11, it says, Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God, or else, if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. See, in, the, in this verse, Joshua gives the people of Israel a strong warning this is at the end of Joshua. This is Joshua's final remarks to the people of Israel. This is Joshua's final remarks. He, he's an old man at this point, and he's about to die. And so he gathers the people of Israel to, to give his final remarks his last words 
to encourage them and warn them to stay in the Lord. And this is after a, a lifetime of victory, a lifetime of obtaining the promised land. They were victorious in all their battles to obtain the promised land, which God had promised them to give the descendants of Abraham. And here the descendants of Abraham are all gathered in. They have their tribes, they have their land, they have their inheritance, which God had given them through his mighty hand leading them through battle. And so Joshua gives his final remarks, his last words, and he earnestly warns the people of God. He says, take careful heed of this. Love your God and do not take marriages with the remnant of the people that are in the land so they have driven out so many armies and so many cities and they have taken captive so many cities but there were still some groups of the people of canaan the jebusites the parasites the hittites there were still some of them left in the midst of the land and so Joshua warns them. And the, Joshua warns them, make sure you drive out the rest of these people, the rest of these wicked people, because if you do cling back to these people, they will become thorns in your eyes, scourges in your side, and traps and snares for you. And they will hinder you as a nation, as the people of God. They will greatly hinder you. This is a common theme throughout the Old Testament. This made this statement might be arguably one of the most important statements made by Joshua. Because throughout the entire Old Testament, the downfall of Israel, of the people of God in the Old Testament, was the idolatry and the wickedness that they were influenced to do because of the remnant of wickedness, the remnant of the people of Canaan that influenced the people of God. It is because of the, the remnant of wickedness and the inheritance and the promised land that the people of Israel began to stumble and that caused them then to become judged by God over and over again like in the book of 1st Kings in 2nd Kings and 1st Chronicles and 2nd Chronicles and in the book of uh, Daniel when they're in Babylon or Nehemiah and Ezra you see all these problems that start to arise because they were influenced So this statement by Joshua, he is pleading for the people, stay true to the promised land, to the commandments of God. Take heed, do not draw and cling to the remnants of this world. So I want to ask you this question today. I want you, I want us to examine ourselves for a moment. Do you feel that you have snares or traps or scourges in your side or thorns in your eyes hindering you from following after God? 
from following the commandments of God, for taking hold of the promises of God that God has promised you? Do you find, like it, like it was for Israel, difficult to follow after God? I want to take you to another book in the Bible because this theme, Joshua actually um, restated what Moses said in Exodus 23. Moses says the same thing, and Joshua is just reiterating, do not do this. In the book of Judges 1, it also reiterates, do not cling back to the nations that are around you, to the remnants of those nations that are in the promised land still, but keep on driving them out. Keep on driving out the remnant of wickedness. So I wanna bring you to the book of Ezra. Ezra 9, verse 1. Reading from Ezra 9, verse 1. And Ezra 9, 1 says, When things were done, the leaders came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands with respect of their abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. So when I heard this, I tore my garment and my robe. I plucked out some of my hair out of my head and beard, and I sat down as astonished. Then everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting and having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord, my God. And I asked, and I, and I said, oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated, humiliated to lift up my face to you. My God, for, your, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. So Ezra describes the book of a group of people coming back from exile. So the so Israel was exiled to Babylon and they were taken captive by Babylon for 70 years because of their idolatry and their wickedness toward God because of the exact same problem that Joshua tells them to that tells that warns them of that problem because they fall into the influence of these remnants, like the, the Hittites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites, because they didn't drive them away, they slowly became great in idolatry, great in wickedness, great in sin. They started to act like the people around them, the wicked people around them. And he led God to judge them so severely that they actually had to be driven out of the promised land. God made a condition to them. He said, if you do not follow my commandments, I will lead you into exile. I will have other nations around you overtake you because you do not follow me. And so because they did not take heed, to Joshua's instruction or Moses's instruction 
to drive out the remnant of these nations. They were influenced, and God calls Babylon and Assyria to take over them and to take them into captivity. So Ezra describes the the post-exilic, uh, it's a post-exilic book where they're coming back from exile, and he describes trying to rebuild the house of God. And he struggles to rebuild the house of God because he goes back to where they were taken captive. And he comes back for a little time to Israel, to Jerusalem. And he comes back to terrible news. And the news was that came to him is that the leaders, even the leaders of Israel and the people of God have married themselves, have have given their daughters or given their sons to, to be in marriage with the with the with the nations with the remnant of the nations with the Canaanites and the wicked nations that were left in the promised land so Ezra when he hears this news, he was greatly sorrowful, greatly troubled. He, he said, I was astonished that we would do such a great sin after God has done such a miraculous work to bring us out of exile. They come just out of exile, and the people are already clinging, how Ezra describes it, to the incorruptible seed. They were a holy seed, but they started to already cling themselves to the nations around them that were not a part of the promised people of God, and they were making their holy seed to bind themselves to the incorruptible seed. And so this is also speaking to us today. You were born of an incorruptible seed. See, 1 Peter 1.23 says that you were born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, a holy seed through Jesus Christ. We are not to mix ourselves as the people of Israel did. We are not to mix ourselves with incorruptible seed. Ezra rebukes the leaders of Israel because they are corrupting the holy seed with the remnant of wickedness that is left in the land. Could we be as believers corrupting the holy seed by allowing ourselves to keep marriages of wickedness in our hearts? Could we be clinging to the world? And, and the word marriages, do not make marriages. It just meant do not make covenant with those of the world. And this we could imply, do not make covenant with the things of the world. But oftentimes, as believers, we start to make covenant with the things of the world. We start to cling to the things of this world rather than cling to the things of God. We start to cling to certain bad habits. We start to cling to certain sins. We start to cling to certain worldly passions and worldly admirations instead of having heavenly-minded 
hearts. So could we be as believers, where we have been born again of incorruptible seed, could we be mixing ourselves with corruptible seed by making covenant, by clinging ourselves, by making marriages to the things of the world? I want to bring you to the next book right after Ezra, where it's describing again a very similar situation. In the book of Nehemiah, I want, want to go to the last chapter of Nehemiah 13, verse 23. Nehemiah 13, verse 23. Nehemiah also is a post exilic uh, um, book where it's describing the people of God returning back from exile. And this is another group. Uh, Ezra brings one group, Nehemiah brings the last group that comes from Ezra or that comes from exile. And they overlap Ezra and Nehemiah, and they face the same problem, and they respond in very similar ways. So Nehemiah 13, 23 says, In those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language one or the other people. So I contended with them and cursed them. I struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wide to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations, there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, no, actually, I want to stop there. But Nehemiah has the same astonished reaction that Ezra did. He, he, came, he saw the, the wickedness that has trickled in the, the people that have been that have come out of exile and are now trying to rebuild Jerusalem. They're trying to rebuild the walls. And already, just at the end of the book, when all seems well, he sees a section of Judah where they have been marrying themselves, that they have been making covenant, that they have been intermingling with the people of Ashdod and Moab, pagan women and men, they have married themselves to. So Nehemiah goes around striking them and kicking them out and rebuking them and yelling at them and urging them. I say, did you not know that this is why we fell into exile in the first place and we're already going back to marrying these people? these pagan women he's he he says look at solomon the great and wisest man on the world did he not fall by marrying himself to the things of this world by making covenant with the remnants of wickedness that were left in the promised land because they did not drive him out solomon was enticed by their by their livelihood, by the way they lived, he was enticed and took pagan women for him to marry. And it even caused Solomon to sin. He says, 
And Nehemiah says, why? Why would you go back to marrying and, and doing this great evil transgression to our, uh, against our God? So I, I urge you today, do not, so, so I want to paint this picture. We are, in, in Ephesians 1, 13 through 18, it says that whatever we do on this earth is the inheritance of Jesus Christ. And that we are the inheritance of Christ. Just how the people of Israel had an inheritance, the land of Canaan, the promised land, that was their inheritance. And that was the inheritance of God for his son, Israel, the children of Israel, to inherit the land. In the New Testament, we are our heart. Our lives is an inheritance to Christ. Think of how profound that is. You, Jesus paid the price so that you would inherit Jesus and he would inherit you to himself. But, I want us to examine our hearts today. Has just like the Israel, uh, just like the children of Israel, left remnants of the world, remnants of wickedness in the land. Could we be leaving remnants of wickedness in our hearts? See, I don't want to take this lightly. You see Ezra tear his garment and rip hair out of his head and rip hair out of his beard and weep and fast before God saying there's a remnant of wickedness that we have clung to. And then you see Nehemiah with the same situation and he, and he strikes people and he yells at people, and he kicks people out of the synagogues, and he says, we have done a great evil and transgression by clinging to the remnants of wickedness in this world. So I want, I urge you today to look within your heart as we are the inheritance, and that our hearts are the promised land of God, that I want you to look within your heart and say, Lord, have I left a remnant of of wickedness within my heart. Have I left pieces of the world in my heart? Are there still things in my heart that I used to desire before I was born again, before I was born of incorruptible seed. Is my heart mixed with something corruptible? Do I still have passions that are corruptible, that will one day perish? Are all my passions born of incorruptible seed? Are all my passions born of God. See, on, Jesus states that only a little leaven leavens the entire lump, that it is the little foxes that spoil the entire vineyard. So you might look at yourself, you might look, we might look at ourselves and say, well, you know, I give a lot to the church. I I go to church every Sunday. I say my prayers every night. But you know, here and there, I still sin. I still love the pleasures of this world a little bit too much. I still desire 
to cling to some of the things of this world. You know, I, I'd rather watch my favorite TV show than dig in to the word of God. I, I, I might want to hang out with friends or family rather than to, to get on my knees and commune with the Holy Spirit. I said, this, this, is there a remnant? Have you made any covenants? Have you so fastly cling to the things of this world? A remnant of wickedness in this world. Because it, it is this that made the people of God fall into great sin. See, back, it says back in Joshua 23, God says, if you don't drive out these nations from before you, this remnant of wickedness from before you, he said, I can no longer bless you. I can no longer give you victory. I can no longer prosper you. You will not feel like a great and mighty nation if you do not drive them out. So God gives us the responsibility. He says, you must drive them out because if you don't drive them out, I can't drive them out for you. You have to make the executive decision, the ruler of your heart. You, you have to say, I do not want any passions of this world, any remnant of wickedness. I want my heart to be a holy and beautiful inheritance to my Lord Jesus Christ that I will drive out these remnants of wickedness. And God says that he will give you the strength to do so. But I, I want to give you a couple points. to actually examine your heart and take action to drive out any remnant of wickedness in your heart. See, in, in Matthew 15, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees And he says to them, I, they try to attack Jesus for not following all the traditions that the Pharisees have set up. And Jesus says, Isaiah said, well, well did Isaiah prophesy of you that these people have mouths and lips and they close to me, but their hearts are far from me. And he says, you, you make the commandments of God void by clinging to the traditions of man. And sometimes we cling to tradition more than having our heart set upon him. And, and then in a couple other, in I think 10 later verses in the same chapter of Matthew 15, Jesus then says, you know, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man because what goes into the mouth goes into the stomach and then is eliminated, but it is what comes out of the mouth. He says, because what proceeds out out of the heart makes you holy or not. So Jesus emphasizes the heart in this chapter. And he says, what proceeds from the heart is evil thoughts, murders, anger issues. So let's just think. I want us to examine our hearts because jesus says examine your heart right and he says what proceeds out of the heart is evil thoughts 
Lord, do I have any evil thoughts? Do I have, and he says, what proceeds out of the heart is murder. Do I have hatred or bitterness towards people? What proceeds out of the heart is adultery and fornication. Lord, is there any sexual immorality that I need to flee from? What proceeds out of the heart is thefts. What proceeds out of the heart is false witness and lying and blasphemy. These all proceed out of the heart. Bitterness, hatred, malice, contentions, anger, outbursts of wrath, cowardness, unbelieving, unfaithfulness, unloving, unforgiveness. These proceed out of the heart of a person. These are remnants of wickedness that God urges us to drive out. So I want us to give us a, a, a couple points to, to help us drive out the remnants of wickedness that may remain in our hearts. And number one is love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. See, I love what Joshua says before saying, before warning them, before warning them to drive out the remnant of wickedness, before warning them that the nations will become snares and scourges and traps and thorns. Before warning them, he said this in verse 11. He says, take heed. The children of Israel, take heed and love the Lord your God. You see, this is what is supposed to drive us. This is what motivates us. This is our fire that we would love the Lord your God. Love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God. And built on this love, you will have the strength to drive out the remnant of wickedness that still may remain in your heart. See, the love of God is not complicated. The love of God is what we see all over. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. The full manifestation of God's love was poured upon this earth when Jesus was upon Golgotha Hill, where he was nailed to two intersecting wooden beams, and he shed his blood for our sins. See, this is the manifestation of God's love for us. Love the cross. Look upon the cross where our blessed Savior chose to become a man, to be beaten and bruised and stripped of his clothes, naked and ashamed. He bore our for iniquities and transgressions and our diseases and our sins upon that cross. That was his love that he has poured upon us. Now we owe it all to him to love him back. Love the cross the manifestation of God's love to us. Love Jesus Christ. Love him. Joshua says, take heed and love the Lord your God. I urge you today.
that some of us, we need to get, in, get on our knees and say, Lord, I have not loved you like I should love you. I have prioritized so many other things above you. I prior I have loved my my career before you. I spend time for my my job above you. I spend more time reading other things than the word of God. I spend more time watching TV shows and movies than spending time on my knees and pouring out my love to you and pouring out my adoration, pouring out my thankfulness, pouring out my love to you, Jesus. Number one. Love the Lord your God. Number two is built upon the foundation of great love that we have for Christ. Number two is flee from the pleasures of this world. You see, the people of, the, of Israel... If they did not drive out the people, the remnant of these nations that were left in the promised land, they would either just make them their servants. They would just oppress them. But God told them to drive them out. So some of us, it's easy for us that we might still have habits from our previous life before we were born again. We might have, have habits of bitterness, habits of sexual immorality, habits of pride, habits of boasting of ourselves. And Instead of heeding what God says in his word to utterly drive them out, we sometimes do what the people of Israel did. And that is, if, we, if they didn't drive them out, they just made them their servants. And so that's what we try to do. We, we try to suppress the wickedness that we have left in our hearts. We try to suppress the anger issues. We try to suppress the lust. We try to suppress the pride. We try to suppress certain sins or certain passions that we have over this world that we, that we know deep down in our hearts is not pleasing to God. But God said, drive them out. Drive them out. Flee from such things. Flee from such wickedness that it might be left in your heart. Joseph fleed from sexual immorality. He fleed. He ran away. Do not love, I, 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 ur I urge us as a church, do not love the things of this world more than Jesus Christ. Do not love movies. Do not love your career. Do not love your job. Do not, I, I urge you, do not love the things of this world more than the things of Christ, more than Christ himself in 2024. That is the first Sunday in 2024. May God your priority that you will love him more than all these agendas and plans and things of this world. And then number three, when we take courage 
when we are serious and say, I will love the Lord my God and I will flee from and I will drive out the remnants of wickedness from my heart. Number three, we will inherit all the promises of God. Inherit, I encourage you, inherit the promises of God made to you. You see, number two is so important because Esau chose a bowl of soup rather than inheriting his birthright, which is the birthright representing here the the promise of God. He he was going to obtain the promise of God. But Esau chose a bowl of soup. And it sounds ridiculous to us today. But all that is, is Esau desired the pleasures and comfort of this world than his birthright. He then the promises of God. You you might you might have the thought you might have this thought in the past or right now. You you see all these promises in the Bible, promises of healing your physical body, promises of uh, joy unspeakable, promises to prosper you in the works of your hand and your finances, promises to prosper your emotional state, prosper your family, your, 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 the fruits of your labor. Just, you see these promises in the Bible and and we wonder why have why haven't I obtained them? Why have I not taken hold of them? Why don't I see the results of these in my life? I read this all throughout the Bible of these great and awesome promises. You, maybe you're thinking that in your life, uh, maybe you're thinking that in your life there are some snares, that there are some traps that there are scourges in your side, that there are thorns in your eyes that are hindering you from running the race to obtain all these promises that you see God has promised you in your life. And and maybe you feel that you are not prospering in the full purpose and in the good works that Christ has predestined for you to do because you feel held back by something. I I tell you in 2024, when you decide to love the Lord your God with all your heart, then to flee from the pleasures of this world and no longer make covenant with them, you will inherit the abundant promises that God has set before you. Just how God gave the children of Israel the inheritance of the land of Canaan, we also stated in in Ephesians 1, that we are the inheritance of Christ. We want we are the we are the we are Christ's inheritance as his saints. We want I ask us to check our hearts in this moment. We want to be a beautiful, blameless, holy inheritance in bride for our Lord Jesus Christ, that we will drive out the remnants of wickedness in our hearts to be a beautiful, loving bride for our Christ, for the Lord Jesus Christ. I urge you today, 2024, 
We do not want any snares, any traps, any scourges on our side because of the wickedness or the remnant or the secret sin or the secret, you know, I, I dabble in a little bit of this sin, but not as much as I used to, or no, we want to be completely liberated because who the sun sets free is free indeed. We want to have joy unspeakable in 2024. We want to, we want God to prosper the work of our hands. We want restored relationships. We want to see our family saved. We want to see the promises of God fulfilled in our lives. So we will drive out the remnants of wickedness that may lay in our hearts. The remnant, we want our hearts to be a beautiful inheritance for Jesus Christ. We want to love the Lord our God with all our hearts. We do not want to reserve anything in our hearts, but we want to love Jesus Christ and the price that he paid for us. So we can flee the temptations and the, the comforts of this world and obtain the promise of God and be a beautiful bride, a beautiful inheritance, a body of saints that is holy and blameless for our Lord. Jesus Christ. See, the people of Israel, the children of Israel had a decision. They had a decision to either heed what Joshua was urging them to do or to not and allow the remnant of wickedness within the promised land to remain. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We don't want a little, just, a, a, oh, it's a, it's a small remnant. Are we better than Solomon, the great and wise king who fell by these exact things? Through the blood of Jesus, he will give us a new heart. He will create in us a new heart. Through the blood of Jesus, he will purify us. Through his strength and his grace, he will help us drive out. But there, was, there, there they had a choice to actually take up courage and drive those remnants of wickedness out of the land. So I want us to take a moment and, and go before God on this first Sunday of 2024. We want 2024 to be the best year that we have ever had being holy and blameless for the Lord being beautiful, being in love with Jesus Christ. I urge you, don't let another year go by without giving all our hearts to Christ. So I just ask you, let's just close our eyes and examine our hearts for this moment. Oh, Jesus Christ, we come before your throne of grace with courage, that you love the children of God, that you love us as a child, as a saint, as your inheritance. Jesus, we want to love you more. We don't want another year to go by. But on this first Sunday of 2024, 
We want all our hearts to love you. We don't want a reserved remnant of wickedness, a secret sin, a secret passion of this world to be left in our hearts and to leaven our entire hearts. Lord, we take courage this year. We ask for your grace and your strength to drive out the remnants of wickedness in our hearts. Lord, I don't wanna be bitter anymore. I don't wanna struggle with lust anymore. I don't wanna struggle with anger anymore. I don't wanna struggle with depression anymore. I want to be liberated from these snares and these traps. And I wanna be holy and blameless and love you with my heart. Lord, I ask you today, I ask that you convict each and every one of us this day. Convict wherever we are, oh Lord. I ask that your Holy Spirit, that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon each and every one of their hearts in Jesus' mighty name, that you would, that you would enlighten them, that you would, that you would remind them of certain things that you want to prune them of. Certain things that you want to trim them off, trim off of them. Abide. Lord, we want to abide in your love. Abide in you and cut off the unfruitful branches, just as John 15 says. Oh, Holy Spirit. Give us the strength and the courage and the power to drive out any remnant of wickedness that we may love you more than ever this year. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you all for your time. It is beyond greatly appreciated. <laughs> and I love you all. And I can't wait to see you until I come back. <laughs> so from school thank you so much